Welcome to SB Talks. Today is Tuesday, August 27th, and I am joined as ever by our Chief Investment Officer, Nick Ryder. Welcome, Nick. Thank you, Vinny. Now, today, Nick and I will be discussing the Australian earnings season, the US uh, rate outlook following the Jackson Hole Symposium, and what we are going to be looking out for over the week ahead. Welcome to all our listeners. We will start at home if we can today. We are about two thirds of the way or so through the domestic earnings season. Uh, anything catching your eye? Um, it's It's been a sort of ho-hum earnings season. So 61% of companies have reported so far uh, for year results. Uh, only 48% have beat analyst expectations, which is probably around average in Australia. Okay. You know, And that compares to, say, the US, which just wrapped up its um, second quarter earnings season. 79% of companies beat in the US. So... We tend to find a lower beat rate in Australia. Is, there, is the analyst predictions any factor in that? How, how, were, how exuberant were some of the forecasts leading into this earnings season? Uh, uh, there have been quite a lot of uh, downgrades coming into um, earnings season. So we typically see what we call confession season yep. in, the, in sort of May, June, as companies um, start to guide analysts that they maybe won't hit yep. the, the, what's um, out there in the street as uh, expectations. Uh, but even so, there was still a bit of disappointment. I think there's some, you know, obviously the Australian market has more um, maybe earnings volatility mm. with miners and energy companies. So there's always those little swing factors that are hard to mm. kind of predict. So there's always booming or busting in some of those sectors. Yep. Yeah. So what, what we call the earnings surprise. So the aggregate earnings have come in about 4% below Okay. Uh, analyst expectations. So a, a slight miss overall. Uh, uh, that was actually before BHP. So BHP just reported this morning uh, and their earnings, certainly their um, reported earnings uh, were down uh, 39% right. uh, to $7.9 billion. So those aggregate numbers I just mentioned will probably move a little bit after they're incorporating the... You know, BHP will move BHP. the dial. What, um, what were driving those results for BHP? Any material items in particular stand out? Uh, so they, you might recall they are closing down their nickel operations mm. in WA because of oversupply of nickel globally. Um, so, so they've had to um, make some substantial provisions for that. Uh, and there's also still legacy um, provisions for the Brazil dam disaster right. for, from, I think it was, I don't know, seven years ago, it seems like now. But those obviously those claims are still sort of flowing mm. through. So yeah, down to seven point nine billion US from um, twelve point nine uh, last year, and they've cut their dividend. But if you look at the underlying yep. results, it's sort of pre-provision um, earnings are actually up two percent, so slightly okay. better um, numbers coming out of iron ore and copper. Um, and have you had a chance of they had anything in terms of their forecasts or made any commentary yet in terms of what they're expecting uh, iron ore from here? No, no, they haven't. Uh, we have seen the iron ore come off about mm. 25% over the past six months or so. So it's below $100 a tonne. So, um, you know, given what's going on in China with their yeah. property uh, sector, the outlook for iron ore is, is pretty gloomy. Um, so I think, yeah, they haven't really said anything. Mm. I have to I obviously have to go and have a look at mm. through the results and see what the analysts say over the next day or so about it but, but i think there seems to be a, a general caution with yeah the there's a general outlook. caution that said they did say um that they're prepared to look at acquisitions mm. they you might recall they looked at anglo-american i think that was a, a 40 billion dollar potential deal that they were interested in doing at one point uh, so they're still on the hunt for for big uh, big projects or mm. big big acquisitions and uh, and their debt overall net debt is 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 still uh you know, sort of within their target range, it's only uh, nine billion. So they've got pl plenty of firepower if they wanted mm. to to buy a mere, stuff. A mere nine billion. A yeah. mere nine billion. That's mm. right. Yeah. Anything else catching your eye in, in yeah. the season? Yeah. So apart from sort of energy and materials being sort of the big drags on overall earnings, um, IT and healthcare were, were sort of two standout sectors where the results were were pretty good actually. Um, so. You know, continuing that theme that we've been talking about, that sort of growth and quality um, seems to be where, you know, where to invest at the moment, you mm. know, globally and in Australia, although obviously IT and healthcare are fairly small sectors in Australia. So mm. companies like WiseTech had a pretty good result. Um, 
the health insurers have had, you know, Medibank, Private and NIB have had good results, um, you know, because of um, sort of squeezing the hospitals mm. and, uh, and getting good premium increases. So there are a couple of the things that stood out for me. Excellent. Um, let's step across to the US if we can. And over the last week or so, we've had the Jackson Hole Symposium, uh, obviously very well reported on. And the particular outlet speech by uh, Chair of the Fed, Jerome Powell, is uh, very much poured over, and particularly the last few years, in terms of his expectations of inflation and, and more recent times, economic outlook and rates seems to be cementing in very much the trend now as we are heading down. Yeah, so we had the Fed minutes earlier in the week and they said, I think it was the words, the vast majority considered a September cut would likely be appropriate. So the market was already pre prepared mm. for, um, you know, Powell talking about September maybe being a rate cut, but it was quite a dovish speech. Mm. He did say that um, the time has come for policy to adjust. They've got confidence that inflation is heading sustainably back to the 2% target. Uh, but the Fed doesn't seek or welcome further labour market cooling. So he has given a nod to the second part of the Fed's mandate, which is 2% uh, inflation is the first part, second part is maximum employment. So I think increasingly they're looking at that second bit and saying, ooh, the labour market's cooling. Now, he did say that some of the labour market cooling was due to supply, which is fine. People aren't being laid off. Uh, it's, you know, population expansion through immigration uh, and labour force participation going up. So, but I think you could, you could detect an undercurrent that if they were to see further deterioration mm. or cooling in the labour market, that wouldn't be helpful. And certainly there was a, a nod to that. In terms of the timing and pace of cuts... Uh, he really um, was, he didn't give anything away on that. Uh, basically said it depends on the data, the risks and the outlook. So everybody's getting very excited about September. Uh, yeah. The market's starting to price in a more material possibility of a 50 basis point, point cut rather than 25. Yeah, so there's about a third of a chance of a 50 basis mm. point cut. So 34 basis points priced in. Um so certainly that's on the table and everything will really come down to the uh, August non-fund payrolls report, which we'll get on the 5th of September. So if that's right. another weak one, like you might recall, mm. the last one we had was weak and that put the market into a bit of a wobble. Uh, if we get another weak one, then that could mean mm. a 50 basis point cut. I think also if we get more financial market jitters, you know, the Fed might also do a 50. Um, Otherwise, probably 25. They'll start yeah. off with 25 and then probably slowly work their way, slowly into work it. Their way up. Yeah. But I, I would add that there's sort of three meetings left in the year and there's 100 basis points of cuts okay. priced in by year end. So, and a very material election in there as well. And a material election mm -hmm. as well. So um, some people were saying, oh, the Fed wouldn't want to be cutting before the election, but clearly mm -hmm. that's not the case. They will be. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. We watched that one, but I think market now very much excited with the downward trajectory, albeit probably um, hopefully slow and steady there, I imagine, as they bring rates back in towards what will be their sort of long term target zone. We are yet to see their sort of where do, what's your read on that? Yeah, we've had a few Fed speakers sort of talking about it. And I think the general consensus is around that three to three and a half percent. So. Mm -hmm. You know, what's that 200 basis points of cuts probably over the next year, 18 mm. months, you know, that sort of thing. So maybe, you know, 25 basis points a quarter or, you know, it's it's, it's hard to tell what the mm. actual trajectory will, will be. It, it is very much data. I was going to say it really. Yeah. We've had this sort of US uh, economic exceptionalism their, their economy has proved incredibly robust but now definitely showing some signs at least of, of, of creaking at the edges so if that was to exacerbate then yes they will go harder yeah, yeah i mean there is a worry that the you know the u.s economy is cooling but you know there's not that many signs like retail sales yeah. came out recently they were pretty good still uh, as i mentioned the quarterly um, reporting season in the us if you look at the consumer companies mm. they generally said there's a deceleration 
in spending, but they're still spending is still at healthy levels. Uh, consumer confidence is, I guess, okay. So I, I think the U.S. economy is is fine. There's a little bit of uh, pullback in investment around the election uncertainty. So mm. once we get the, through the ad election period, that maybe will pick up again. That's quite common. Markets often yeah. have a bit of jitters heading into the elections just with that policy uncertainty of what's to come and yeah. possibly a bit of that. Given the change in um, Democratic candidate, probably some policy uncertainty in just what exactly Kamala Harris's platform is. But that again should potentially become clear over the next six or eight weeks ahead. We will see. Yeah, absolutely. Um Global PMIs uh, recently came out as well, so continuing a bit of the uh, the trend where manufacturing begins to to slip, but services stay robust. Yeah, we, we've seen services be fairly strong for the last couple of years, and that's still the case. What has been interesting was manufacturing was in sort of in the doldrums, and then we, we went through a sort of a bit of a recovery in manufacturing at what we call a restocking cycle. Yeah. So as as companies and manufacturers and wholesalers run down inventories, they need to put orders in again, and so there was a bit of a restocking cycle that seems to have run out. You know, I think there's this mm. this concern about you know just how strong the economy is, how strong the consumer is. And so maybe people aren't ordering as much and that's flowing through into the manufacturing Businesses cycle. Businesses are being just a tad cautious. They've, yeah. they've done the restocking after a period of caution, but now no need to uh, be over exuberant at this point. Yeah. And of course, there's that whole uncertainty around global trade policy and tariffs mm. with electric vehicles, with Europe and China and tit for tat tariffs. So I think that probably is also having a bit of an impact on the global manufacturing mm. sector as mm. well. Yeah, well, I guess a bit of an election overhang there in the U.S. as well, yeah. given, given some of those policy settings that we talked about. What's on the radar? What are you looking out for over the next week or two ahead? Uh, so the key things for me over the next week or so will be um, tomorrow we get the monthly CPI reading for July in in Australia. In Australia, always now, we, a we, touch of caution with that one. We know the monthly ones can be a bit give you a bit of a misread sometimes, and particularly the first one in the quarter it tends to be quite goods heavy, so mm. less services are being measured in that that monthly read. So that that'll be interesting. I don't think it necessarily will change the dial too much in terms of what the RBA does, but it's always a data point, just another data point. Mm. Uh, we also get NVIDIA reporting its second quarter earnings. You know, obviously the bellwether AI stock, um, heavy, high expectations. So the, the market's looking for uh, $28.7 billion of revenue, which is up 112% on a year ago. Yeah. Uh, and they're looking for a gross margin of about 76%, so that's- which, is, which is amazing. You know, a company can earn 76% mm. profit margin. On that phenomenal level of uh, sales growth and revenue yeah. growth as well. It's, it, the, the share price has rallied, as we've talked about on this podcast before, enormously over yeah. the last sort of 18 to 24 months. So now the market is looking its payback for that, that share price growth. Yeah, and I mean credit to Nvidia, they've they've pretty much delivered every time. So mm-hmm. they they're really yet to disappoint the market. Um, but there's always a first, mm-hmm. uh, and it's trading on 37 times earnings, so a bit of a premium to the other tech stocks in the sector. So so that will definitely be one to watch uh, this week. Uh, we also get the Fed's preferred inflation measure, the core PCE. Mm-hmm. Um, that's different to the CPI, is some differences in how it's calculated. Um, not that material because we already know what the CPI was and that gives us a reasonably good read of what the core PCE inflation yeah. measure will be, but that's coming out later this week. Um, so they're, they're the sort of the main things over the next week or so that I'll be looking yeah. for. Excellent. Oh, wonderful roundup, as always. Um, we look forward to catching up again in a couple of weeks and we'll be a bit closer to seeing what's happening in the US. So thank you, as always, Nick, and thank you to all our listeners. Thank you.